All right, I do believe we are live. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Break the Rules stream. I am your host, Love Polyakov, and it is an immense pleasure to be here today with two intellectual titans. We have, for the very first time, Daniele Bolelli, Bella, joining from the History of Fire podcast. You know him and love him from the various appearances on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. You are a professor, you are a writer. You are an MMA fighter. You are an all-around master of these various uh, these various crafts. And Alexander Bard, the amazing, incredible philosopher, back here on BTR. As always, it is a great pleasure to see you, Alexander. Today, we are going to be talking about Friedrich Nietzsche and what exactly Friedrich Nietzsche's ideas mean for the West. And I would love to uh, get started with Daniele. And uh, before that, once again, for all the newcomers, be sure to subscribe, uh, like, click that bell, very important for the algorithm, and share this around with everybody. So, Daniele, beyond the introduction that I gave, please let me know anything else that you would like to add in there. And, uh, yeah, your thoughts on Nietzsche and how Nietzsche relates to what, specifically, I'd say the West is going through right now. One of the things that looking at the history of Western philosophy, one of the things that I particularly love about Nietzsche is that so much of Western philosophy has been this emphasis on uh, thought, on, you know, the Descartes uh, cogito ergo sum kind of idea. I think, therefore, I am. This emphasis on even like a guy who like Nietzsche, like Heidegger, that this whole thing is like, I, I'm paraphrasing, it's not the exact quote, but something along the line of like, one of the main problems has been that uh, since the beginning, humanity has uh, acted too much and not thought enough. And Nietzsche very much turns that on its head, where it, almost a direct challenge to Heidegger in that one, uh, reverse, because of course, chronologically wise, but like, one, one of the things Nietzsche said was like, uh, one of the main problems is that uh, humanity hasn't enjoyed enough, you know, and he puts this emphasis on uh, there's a certain vitality in Nietzsche's thought. There's a certain passion and intensity. And at the end of the day, it's not uh, when Nietzsche talks about uh, being distrustful of any thought that is not uh, a source of happiness for your muscles. That's a fantastic, that's a beautiful line. You know what I mean? There's like, he's bringing back the idea of thinking of philosophy of the, this kind of sort of high minded thing. You need to be brought back to a level where it makes a difference in your daily life. It makes a difference in how you, on your level of vitality of certain, certain thoughts, certain modes of thinking, increase your vitality and other depress it. And so this emphasis on energy in a way this emphasis on uh, joy this uh, which by the way is funny because most people hear of Nietzsche they don't associate joy as one of the primary words with him usually you know but if you dig not even that deep it's very much there which is funny because when you compare it to his actual life he had a hell of a hard life um so much about his life was very rough so for him to be able to say things like that it's rather impressive and I think I dig this aspect, the fact that before even something that you agree or disagree, when it comes to Nietzsche, to me, Nietzsche is something you feel before you even talk about, you know, how is, what exactly his ideas are and how they, uh, what's their intellectual impact. To me, it's like there's an emotion and a feeling that comes in that you rarely get in a whole lot of Western philosophy. So right off the bat, I feel that Nietzsche starts one step ahead. Like my dad at one point wrote a book, the title was called uh, Descartes Can't Dance, which I felt it uh, applies here. You know, it's very much about there, there are ideas, there are philosophies that nourish life, and others that they feel like a game for nerds with too much time on their hands, you know? Definitely. Alexander, uh, what say you? Yeah, Daniela does a wonderful opening because it sets up Nietzsche against Hegel. And uh, I've always thought this is a great combo. And, and there's a great rivalry here. There's a great dichotomy between the two. Hegel is the master of thought as thought. His entire project was about that. And I always read Hegel and Nietzsche in parallel with each other. Not, 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 
they're, they're complementary. They must be sort of complementary. So when when Hegel actually claims that he he has he has reached a certain point called absolute knowing, he means that. And there's something to it. It's like it's like if you think thinking as itself of thinking, it's like thinking thinking itself of thinking. I think Hegel reached the point where you couldn't go any further. And and I think as I, I the break with Kant. Kant did the big turn in Western philosophy. He realized actually that we create a certain imaginary world in our heads. The world out there is an entirely different world, and therefore the world out there will collide with our fantasies constantly all the time. So Kant made the big turn, the Copernican turn, if you compare to physics, that happened in philosophy was what happened with Immanuel Kant. Hume did a good job before Spinoza is also important, Leibniz is important. These guys did the, the work between Descartes and Kant. Well, Kant comes, there's a major break. But what Hegel did was that Hegel realized that the whole subject object opposition in Kant is false because the subject and the object are byproducts of a project that goes on. There's a process that goes on all the time. And this break that Hegel does, I'm adamant, is incredibly important. It also opens up the door for Nietzsche. So if Hegel finishes, the, the the thinking of thinking itself is thinking. This sort of this whole inner world. Heidegger is nothing to add to it. I think Hegel finished it, to be honest about it. And when I then went on to Nietzsche, I discovered Nietzsche goes off in an entirely different direction. He's not the only guy who does that. Philosophy has a golden era in the 19th century because it's basically free after Hegel to pursue anything it wants. The classical philosophy is kind of ended, finished with Hegel. Now it's all process also. Hegel also shifts philosophy from the obsession with space to the obsession with time, which was about time in Western thinking, because Eastern thinking is always concentrated on time anyway. That's probably why Daniel is a Taoist. I'm a Zoroastrian. We're going to get to that later. But the reason why time is prior to space starts with Hegel. What the Nietzsche does is that he takes this ideal process very, very seriously, and he goes off in an entirely new direction. So does Freud. So does Darwin. You know, the, the, the great thinkers come in the 19th century simply because Hegel has finished the classical product of thinking, thinking as thinking for itself. So you, we, we're on to totally different products. What Nietzsche does, I'm, I'm working on an anthology right now with young Nietzscheans today. Had a last in Owen Cox and in, in Daniel Gardner, some of the guys set up the initiative, and I'm going to write for this anthology. And I'm working on something called Nietzsche narratology. I'm doing narratology myself. I'm just, I'm basically doing a philosophy about humans because humans tell stories about themselves all the time. And we tend to confuse these stories with each other, which creates a lot of confusion, which is absolutely unnecessary. There's pathical narrative, there's, there's mythical narrative, there's certainly logical narrative, and we need to keep these things separate. And Nietzsche works with those things. He works with those things. He has the three characters, Nasus, Prax, Zarathustra. He has the camel, the lion, and the child. They fit perfectly with the narratology that John Sedeck is now exploring, but because the camera is essentially the logos of the storytelling, and the line is essentially the pathos, the only masculine, and the child having a certain feminine quality to it is the mythos, which is the only way for the other two stories to be united. This is the profound insight that Nietzsche explores in Arsus Prax Zarathustra. So I'm into Nietzsche in metaphysics. Hey, yeah, I'm a great, great fan of Nietzsche. I wouldn't do philosophy without it. And I even took it so literally seriously that I went back to studying the original Zoroaster, who's was actually a lot closer to the fictional Zoroaster on Nietzsche's books. You ask any Zoroaster, they basically say it's the same character. It, it's really ironic. And Nietzsche obviously knew quite a lot about it. He writes about the Hassar, you know, the, the, the Persian Empire, things like that. And he applies that onto Zarathustra. So you know he was playing around with the character where the historical character would actually play into his fictional character quite easily. But I, I converted Zoroastrianism in 1992. Not because of Nietzsche, but he certainly opened the door for me to explore that religion and one day become a convert. So in that sense, I became more Nietzsche than Nietzsche himself, which is what I always desired. And uh, where do you, Alexander, see Nietzsche playing a role in what exactly is going on today with the West? Oh, okay, of course. So people blame postmodernism on Nietzsche. Nothing could be more wrong. Okay, They blame Nazism on Nietzsche. Nothing could be more wrong. They, even Ayn Rand claimed to be Nietzsche. Nothing could be more wrong. I mean, all those guys are just vulgar misreadings of Nietzsche. There is a pattern to a Nietzsche metaphysics. He didn't finish it. And that's actually what's great because... With Nietzsche, there are a lot of unfinished projects. For example, his Dionysian crowd is not really defined as a swarm or a mob. Well, you could do that. You, you can explore that and go into that realm. And it also rhymes with Nietzsche's understanding of what ethics is and, and how you must every day 
clean your head from you know all the destructive thinking accept everything as it is with amur fati and then move on into the freedom of the future which is by the way identical to need to hegel's metaphysics hegel for hegel then the past is a necessity must be dealt with as necessity but the future is contingent and therefore full of freedom and absolutely open to you to explore and co-create so Hegel and Nietzsche have many things here that run with each other, especially on the ethical part. But that's those are the things I'm interested in. And Nietzsche as an unfinished philosopher is, of course, fantastic because you could then become a Nietzschean and do the work you never did. I'll give you a perfect example, Michel Foucault. Also wildly misunderstood, like all Nietzsche. Foucault in his last interview in 1982 said, I don't understand why people call me Marxist. I've never been a Marxist. I've been in Nietzsche my entire life. What Foucault did was that he just took this master slave, he caught him in Hegel and Nietzsche, and switched it around and started searching, what is it like to be a slave and truly enjoy it? <laughs> and, and that sort of dark Nietzsche that Foucault went into is incredibly powerful. Of course, now with woke culture and all this shit going on, it's being blamed on Foucault by Americans who never studied Foucault. History repeats itself. Jordan Nietzsche Peterson. Was, Nietzsche was blamed on tons, for tons of things from people who never studied him. And that's why I always force people to go back to the source and say, where did you get that from? That's not Nietzsche at all. Where did you get that idea from? Because if you want to do pop Nietzsche, you do Oscar Wilde, Mark Twain. They're souls that are very, very aligned with his spirit. They weren't as thorough as he was, but they certainly were Nietzscheans. Well, as far as what Nietzsche was able to predict, as far as what's going on right now, uh, I'd love to bring it back to Daniele to start first. Daniele, what would you say it was that uh, he was pretty spot on about in terms of what we're seeing in our uh, environment today, in our Western culture? I mean, I think for one, the, the collapse of the moral imperatives, the collapse of the absolute way of thinking, which is very much tied to religion, but not only, you know, the, that kind of there's only one truth and this is the one truth and everybody needs to go by it, which is, you know, it's kind of like it goes back to his ideas regarding organized religion in a way. And he foresaw the way organized religion would hit a wall, which doesn't mean it would disappear or anything, but it would definitely hit a wall in terms of its uh, grip on the Western world. Less true in the US, more true in Europe. You know, if you look at, that's actually one of the huge differences today when you go to Europe versus US is that the percentage of people in Western Europe that take organized religion seriously versus the percentage of people in the US that take organized religion seriously. I mean, people talk about the Western world, but they might as well be two entirely different things. You know, it's like radically, radically. And so in that sense, Nietzsche hits it more in a way that clicks with the current European state than the American one. But of course, it has an influence on US as well. And it has an influence on American culture as well. But I think the big question then becomes, because, you know, people think Nietzsche just purely in this, um, <clears throat> in this terms of destruction of certain values that used to be, you know, the way society organized itself prior to this. That's like a, the smallest part of Nietzsche. Uh, but then there's the whole creative part of Nietzsche, which I think is where much of the Western world has not caught up on, is that it's pretty clear where the destruction has taken place. And it was necessary in many ways, because so many of those forces were stifling of creativity, were stifling of individual rights, were stifling of a lot of things. The question is, what has replaced it? And that's where the next step, uh, sort of in what Alexander was saying regarding uh, camel, lion, and child, the child part, which is the more creative part, the part that actually brings value to the work done by the lion and the camel, not that there at a mass level in the West, in the sense that so much has been, you know, you get rid of some fairly poisonous, anything from gender roles to certain stereotypes to ways of thinking, great, and now you replace it for with what? Which has been one of the themes in Nietzsche over and over. You know, when Nietzsche tells you, who cares that you got rid of your chains? That's great. But what did you get of your rid of your chains for? I want to hear, like, why you should be free. Why you should have the right to be free. Why you didn't get give away the best part of yourself and stop being a slave. Which, of course, is provocative and almost insulting. But he's saying, look, opposition to something only goes so far. Mm -hmm. Show me when you get rid of that something, what you bring to the table that's better than that. Yes. 
And that clearly, of course, is easier day than that, because so as long as you have uh, some boogeyman James Bond style, which is the big bad guy that you need to get rid of, whether philosophically, religiously, or in any other way, it's easy. You know, we can find all the reason why this is bad. Replacing it with something that actually brings move the game forward is trickier. And that's why you are stuck today with this ping pong game between bad ideas most often than not. Because, uh, I mean, you mentioned Jordan Peterson before, you know, you have so many people who like this notion of the good old values the way they used to be and missing the good old days. And I know the good old days sucked. And that's why the thing you hate was created as a reaction of the fact that the good old days suck. So now you look at the stuff you see around today and you don't like that either. I can agree, there are very good reasons for that. So rather than saying A kind of sucked, B swung the pendulum a little in a weird way, the other way, it kind of sucks. We should go to see a better place taking the best from A and B. Instead, what you get is A was one way, B was a reaction, I don't like B, so we should go back to A, which is like, hey. <laughs> No, that's not the idea at all here. You know, that's missing the point royally. And and I see it in everything. I see this wrecking ball effect going back and forth where bad ideas created other ideas that had something good and a lot bad. And then as a result of the bad of the second one, it goes back. And you're stuck there and you're like, can we just play a smarter game here? Because we're just, we're getting stuck with bad archetypes. This is Daniele practicing Hegelian dialectics by the master of Hegelian dialectics himself, who's Mr. Friedrich Nietzsche. That's exactly my point. So uh, one way of doing Nietzsche today is to go into the realm of nihilism. So the nihilism is the death of an old paradigm and the birth of a new paradigm. So the way you read Nietzsche today, for example, in my work with Jan Söderqvist, is that the death of God, as it, you know, one of the most famous ideas of Nietzsche, is essentially the death of a paradigm. A certain period of history is over. There's no return to it. And, and that's why what we've done in our work is that we split up the nihilism in four different stages. First, there is a naive nihilism. You don't know that God's dead yet. Okay, but God's dead like in everything around you, context, subconsciousness, whatever. You just don't know. Second phase, cynical nihilism. To describe cynical nihilism, that's when Hillary Clinton goes to church on a Sunday. Nobody in the fuck thinks she believes in fucking Jesus Christ. She still goes to church on Sunday as a politician, pretending going to church and calling yourself a Christian is a proper idea to get elected. That's exactly why people hated her and went for Donald Trump, who was more honest and more authentic. It's the easiest thing in the world. Cynical nihilism is something we're born to hate and we should hate. Today's culture is drenched in it. Its name in Nietzsche is the last man, right? After cynical nihilism, there's affirmative nihilism. But when I got dig, dug deeper into this, I discovered that it's actually an ironic nihilism beneath it all, constantly. And I discovered actually through Zoroastrianism, there's always a religion within the religion, any decent religion, not in Christianity and Islam, but the Jews or the Taoists and the Zoroastrians, the Buddhists, certainly have a religion within their religion. Because if truth is unbearable for people, so they no longer can love their children, then you must not tell the truth to people. There must be realm an agitonology where you don't tell that to the people on the outside, which Nietzsche would totally agree with. This is what's lacking in Christianity and Islam, where the vulgar pop religions of the Nietzsche world and should be disposed to it. But if you go to Judaism and Zoroastrianism, speaking of the West, you have that. And that means there's an ironic nihilism at the bottom of everything all the time. This is the priesthood, a proper Nietzschean priesthood. We know that God was always dead, God, God will always be dead. Fantastic, because then we have to represent God. So people come to us to talk to us, we can talk to God. We go for talk to God. They probably found out that's what we do, but they don't care because all they care about is somebody's talk to God on their behalf so they can act on that. And that's the values of any given society. We call it paradigmatics. These are the values that you nourish in a society. Basically, in a sutric sense, if you speak Eastern philosophy, this is maintain stability in society, keep things together, avo avoid wars and lynch mobs if you can, and make people love their children. Okay, peace and prosperity if you can. Okay, if you can make that happen, you've done your job. That's a sutric realm. The tantric realm, though, is open for anything. There's no dogma in there. There's no absolute truth. To begin with, truths are spoken in pluralist because a logos and a mythos and a pathos are totally different narratives. There's not even one narrative through which a one truth can be spoken. 
There's also a difference between being truth, truth as an act, and claiming truth because your knowledge, which is truth as a fact. Truths are many things. So Nietzsche destroys that there's one truth. So he gets rid of that, he goes ironic. But it's after the ironic you find out the affirmative arise. And this is what Nietzsche is obsessed with. What does it mean to be an affirmative nihilist? What does it mean to celebrate that the old God is dead and claim a new divinity and then try to personify that? That is Nietzsche's project. Mm -hmm. So you have four different nihilisms. The ironic one rises beneath them all. But the three ones you need to go through the paradigm shift, which we currently are going through. We're moving into the digital age. We're leaving the industrial age behind. It's a perfect example of what Nietzsche talks about. You go through the naive and the cynical, but you must get out of the cynical and go into the affirmative. Then between the cynical nihilism and the affirmative is when you switch paradigm. You accept the new world for what it is. You accept its conditions. You realize that new values will come out of your interrelationships with the context you're in, with the world you're in. You basically become a winner in the new society. You become a fucking Elon Musk, whatever you like. And that is being truly Nietzsche. That is embracing and establishing and personifying the new divinity in the new age. And this is how values are created. This is deeply Nietzsche. What uh, do both of you guys make of the movement that let's say we could see, for example, on uh, Tucker Carlson's show where he talks about the uh, eating of the raw eggs and the ball tanning and all this stuff, which sounds ridiculous at first, but a lot of it comes from a lot of young men who feel like society has left them behind and they want to get stronger and they want to have more of a command over reality. Would that be an example of what, Alexander, you were just uh, talking about right now? Yeah, thank God they're left behind. They got to fix themselves and get their shit together. Okay, you're supposed to leave the fucking mamela you've been sucking when you're one year old. You're not supposed to return to mamela. You're supposed to go towards the phallus. And you're supposed to rebel against the phallus in your teenage years. Establish your own phallus in the world and become phallic. That's Nietzsche. Nietzsche doesn't, he doesn't let you sit around like a fucking pussy hound and wiping and weeping and being a fucking victimhood. All these fucking victimhood cults we have today are deeply non-anti-Nietzschean, right? That's not Nietzsche at all. Nietzsche says, you got to love and accept all of history up until now at any given spot. Amor Fati. From then on, the future is yours. Affirm yourself into the future. That's what Nietzsche. Nothing but wouldn't else. that be something that these uh, young men are doing right now, like the ones that are closer to Bronze Age mindset and all that? Would that not be what they're already doing? Because they don't seem to be... I mean, they complain sometimes about things that are going on in society that they don't like, but at least they're working out. No, this at is the this point. The nostalgia never works. Nostalgia mm. is returning to the tick. It's not becoming phallic. The phallic is always in the future, and it's never existed before. You become something never existed before. Judaism does it wonderfully. The exodus out of Egypt. Totally Nietzschean project. A small minority discover they're slaves in a society that don't understand that these are people from the future. Probably they were a failed monotheistic sect. Polytheism returned in Egypt. They realized monotheism was a lot better. They decided to leave Egypt. They walked out as a sect, walked for 40 years, entered the promised land, conquered it, built the temple of God, established a new era, a new paradigm. Perfect example of a Nietzschean project. That's why I'd love to read Nietzsche next to the Jews, like Marx and Marx and Marx and Freud. I don't see what, but I, 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 nostalgia never works. You can never return to something that existed before because it, it's not what you think it is anyway. That's Jordan Peterson crap. It's not Nietzsche. Yeah, and that's I think uh, in regard to that ping pong game between bad ideas that's the point right it's like what is that these guys are missing these guys are missing and that's where they think is Nietzsche they miss the part about strength and toughness and self-reliance and all these things because they have been raised in a way that doesn't instill any of those qualities so they feel like I need to go back to being a Spartan warrior or some shit the problem is that there is a reason why people have sort of look at some of those archetypes with distrust, because they took certain ideas way too far in the sense that, yes, you're tough, you're strong, you're self-reliant, you're also emotionally dead, lacking sensitivity, lacking love, really, and just being the stereotype of this macho, tough guy. Now, the problem is that the people who rejected the macho, tough guy archetype have done so getting rid of the baby with the bathwater. You know, they didn't just get rid of the poison or the aspect of that archetype. They also got rid of the good stuff, of the strength, of the self-reliance, of things that are necessary in any human being that's worth their soul. So to me, it's like the whole project in that regard would be to combine 
these different archetypes. You know, you you combine the fact that yes, you want to be strong and tough and self-reliant and all those other things, as well as sweet and sensitive and be able to play with kids and be able to be more in touch with. Which again is like back to what Alexander brought up about that very beginning of Zarathustra with the whole uh, camel lion uh, child uh, arc. It's, it's exactly missing the integration of these opposite elements. It's like, uh, oh, we have become too feminized, so we need to go back to the old uh, model. And it's like, no, that old model sucks too, and the new one sucks too. It's like, find, it's almost like the Bruce Lee approach, right? Take the best from different sources, combine it together, create something better. Not just try to argue, my partial truth is better than your partial truth, and we are going to argue about which one is less shitty. Why don't we just create something better? Why don't we take the fact that maybe there is something good in the partial truth you bring up. There's also something good in these partial truths, but they all come with a ton of baggage. Take the best from them, recombine them, recreate them, add something new, and and create something that actually works. Well, you're looking for nuance here, and what I'm curious about from Alexander as well is not a lot of people are going to be capable of that kind of nuance do you see a lot of the people who do want to return, maybe they see that they don't have any choice, that the powers that they see as being against them are too strong and are too authoritarian, especially with uh, internet surveillance, that there's not even enough time right now to find some subtlety and some way of combining the best of both worlds? If I, may... I think they're too narcissistic. People are not that interested in them. Maybe they should get the narcissism out the door the first thing they do. And then they all want to get laid, don't they? Okay, sure. Women are a great shit test. They don't sleep around with guys who haven't got their act together. So, yeah, <laughs> more like that. Yeah, and I think in uh, regarding what Alexander was saying about that, when you know you were like, wait, but what are you talking about? Because you're saying you're talking about these guys like they are a victim cult, but they preach this toughness, and that yeah. doesn't seem the opposite of a victim cult. To a point, you know, they say all this shit. But then when you look deep down, it's all based on uh, a ton of this movement are based on resentment, about not feeling accepted, about feeling like, oh, it's uh, I cannot be a real man because those big bad feminists have screwed it all up. I can I can no longer be a real man. Because, and it's like a bunch of, you know what a real man would do? Would not bitch as much as you do. That would be a good start. Would not be this constant whining about the state. And don't get me wrong, there are bad things in the world, there are things that need 100%, but most of the time it's done like, ah, they don't let me be the Superman I want to be. They, it's like, shut up, start like by whining less and embodying it more. But that doesn't give you clout. See, that's the other problem here, that a lot of posters online, they require people to follow what they do, and people like commenting on and engaging with negative things because Lad, it i get life. laid and i'm 61 years old daniel yes. clearly gets laid you can just ask us how you get laid if that's the problem right so the thing is this nobody sleeps with marlboro man if you're a woman nobody sleeps with a loner the self-reliance bullshit get over it out with it what <clears throat> nietzsche uses a single guy as an example is because that is a subjective process but nobody's alone nobody works alone nobody's successful alone it's all about teamwork most guys today are watching gangbang porn most women are aroused by gangbang porn why is this idea that four men are fucking a nymphomaniac such a turn on well, number one, if you ask the women, it's because they would love to see men who got their shit together and have a non-rivalrous loving relationship with other men. Because I can tell you, if you're an infomaniac, you get fucked by four guys. If they guys show any sort of rivalry in between them, you go cold instantly and you're out of it. It's all about the collaboration between the guys. This is all about testing men to see if they can work in a team. So today, the gang, the five guys together, going out in the world together, loving each other, trying to establish something in the world together, like running a company together or going on a large trip together or, you know, exploring the world together is the Nietzschean project. This is the Nietzschean project. These guys who are solo and bitch and moan and think they can somehow be Marlboro Man. Number one, Marlboro Man never gets laid by anybody. No woman ever sleeps with Marlboro Except Man. the horse, probably. Uh, no, like... not even they. You know, it's just like... God, to get paid by Marlboro Man. Marlboro Man's only company is his fucking horse. 
Yeah. Oh no, I didn't mean horse. I meant horse. He, like, nah, his nah, horse nah, nah. is the only company he has. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. No, this single guy, this is a problem reading really Nietzsche. You might read it as a guy who's on an adventure against the rest of humanity. Because in the 19th century, romantics did those kind of stories. But today, that would not, Nietzsche wouldn't write that story at all. He would be an absolute enemy of American individualism, of contemporary narcissism, of contemporary self-obsession. Not that it's interesting. What both Nietzsche and Hegel are concerned with is the deep masculine desire for a project that's bigger than themselves. Well, then, what can okay, I submit yeah, myself yeah. to, and how can I share that with my brother so we have a project together? This is the Hegelian and the Nietzschean project we must study today. Well, then, just to push back on both of you, and before that, just want to say that my own personal view when it comes to a lot of these new movements online is that there are a lot of people in there who are very fascist minded who would want to have a dictator that rules over them there is no doubt about that but with that being said one of the things in that tucker documentary the end of men one of the things that was shown there were a bunch of men who were shirtless who were like working together on something and like competing in various sports things so they weren't just sitting alone with their computer they were finally being able to engage with each other I do see that as being a positive. I'm not seeing that so much from the other side. So that's why, at least if they're already starting to do that, it could go either way. It could go like the uh, youth corps in Germany, which then became you know what, or it can go into the way of actually combining that sensitivity that Daniela, you were talking about. Right. Because one of the things that they also said was that people who are more on the left who look at this stuff, the first thing they think of is homoerotic sex. Sure. Meanwhile, what they're trying to say is like, we can actually just be friends and help each other out without necessarily having uh, the homoerotic elements in there. And that's definitely, you know, if one only look at that part, it's like, sure, that's great. That There's something good there. The problem is that usually that part is the Trojan horse and then there's a mountain of bullshit fascist garbage that's tied uh, hidden within that horse. The horse is awesome. The what brought forth that part is not the problem. That part is actually good. The problem is that there's so much else that go with it. And that's why, in fact, to me, it's not like, uh, you know, when you look at that as almost, uh, that's one of the tragedy of modern thinking that way, that you look at like, on the left, you get a lot of looking at people who are into, I don't know, Tolkien or working out or doing something as a right wing thing. It's like, are you fucking insane? That's not a right. That's strength. Strength is good for anybody. It's good for men, women, and children. It's good for people. It's like there's nothing. And so then there's this game played where you have this more intellectual, lefty, let's be sensitive in a weak kind of way. You have a let's be real man with a fascist overtone, undertone, and everything in between on the right. And it's like, can I please run away? Like it's like it feels like having to choose uh, voting in an American election. It's like, do you want the horrendously shitty one or do you want the just mostly shitty one? And it's like, no, I don't want either. This sucks. These are terrible choices. And I think that's and, and about this fantasy about the tyrant here. So the origin of that fantasy is the Hebrew Persian axis, the Persian Hebrew axis, which is the origin of Western culture. It's a Salshiant in Persian, and that's the Moshiach in, 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 in Judaism, right? It, that is a savior who steps in at the end of time to save us from going down. So this is the shift from cynical nihilism into the affirmative. It's not even a person. It's a function, right? That is then turned into the desire for the tyrant, the dictator in European culture. Now, the dictator is a very immature boy. And his relationship is with the pillar saint. So if you're a guy who only loves what's above your throat, or you think very highly of it, you're narcissistically obsessed, and you hate everything beneath your throat, and you hate any man beneath the throat, you become agnostic dualist like the old Mani was. And you say the world, the physical world is evil, and the only goodness that exists is spirit, and preferably be my spirit because I'm the fucking person. So you're going to bend down before me and follow me. That's an 11-year-old boy whose characteristic is, at best, a priest who hates the chief. 
The other one is the boy pharaoh, Mohammed, Adolf Hitler, Stalin, all these guys were boy pharaohs. They have no sense of humor, not much intelligence, write really crappy books like the Quran and Mao's little red book and Mein Kampf and shitty books like that. Xi Jinping's book, Xi Thought, read it. You'll have a laugh. It's so fucking ridiculously bad, right? If you want to have a fucking title, go to fucking communist China and kiss Xi Jinping's feet because that's exactly what he wants. You could have gone to Russia now before Putin is making a fool of himself. Tyrants fail. Because they're either boy pharaohs who are 11 year old little chiefs who hate the priest, or the little 11 year old priests who think highly of themselves because of smart mind, but hate anything that's embodied, anything that has a dick. That's the pillar saint. Mm. The pillar saint and the boy pharaoh are the trouble with men. And one of them is the spiritual dictator, and of course, the absolute truth in religion. And the other one is the, the political dictator. And these two guys have done their, they, we've had them for 3,000 years. And every time they rear their fucking ugly little heads, we go towards disaster. So I love patriarchy, but this is the false patriarchy the women deserve and we hate too. We've done that now for the last 2,800 years. We've had those guys. We've had the pillar saints and the boy pharaohs. We write about it in the new book, John and I. It's time to leave those and only trust a man who's completely embodied. And fundamentally, in the tribal sense, that is the priest and the chief who love each other to bits. The priest for being the master of the logos and the chief for being the master of the pathos among men. So that men can see, I am, I am these two things too. All men are these two things. But here's the guy with the greatest mind and he respects his own body. Here's the guy with the greatest body respecting his mind. That is the genuine leadership we should look for. It's split, it's divided, and it's a triad because the third installation of that power structure is the fucking matriarch, who says that if you don't deliver, boys, you don't get to fuck my daughters, which is sexuality itself. If you can get this, or even the U.S. Constitution beautifully has this in it because it's built on the Persian imperial structure of the triad. The Supreme Court is a fucking feminine institution. It's basically all the women said, if you don't deliver what you promised, fuck you. Congress supposedly to be the priest because... It it's supposed to be the law, and the president's supposed to be the chief who's supposed to deliver on the law with executive power. Now, it doesn't work very well, but at least it, it immunizes America today from becoming fucking communist China or Russia. And if these boys are running around playing little fascists and they want a fucking dictator, well, you can go and find fucking Putin or Xi Jinping or North Korea. It's no better than that, you know? Hitler would have been totally corrupt and stupid and gone absolutely bonkers by 1952 if he'd won the war anyway. You know, it, Fascism isn't any better than that. Where would you put something like the World Economic Forum people, Klaus Schwab, uh, the, the, some of the UN people, the Great Reset people, all those cats? Which, they're, which role they're would they play? Old, that, I think Daniel Schmachtenberg, my dear friend, is going to the World Economic Forum this year. He's probably going to be the superstar because he's just plundering for new voices. They'll be hard. They're just the old paradigm. I don't have a problem with them, but the old paradigm. That the old paradigm of things that's still relevant. Politics is dying. Academia is dead and over. Industry is dying. Marketing is dying. Advertising. Hey, advertising is the new slavery. If you invest in advertising career right now, you might as well have been educated, become a slave owner in 1895. We, we're dead. The old paradigm is dying. And the point with Nietzsche today is to realize we're the last men. We're the end of that paradigm. If you want to stay with that paradigm, yeah, World Economic Forum are the last men. Personified. Wow. But you could also move into the new paradigm. And their big tech and these guys need to be held responsible by the other two powers we need to be developed to complete the autocracy. We need a censocracy that takes over politics. Basically, AI runs the thing better. And we certainly need a protopian attitude towards creativity. I'm all about art from now on. And the fantastic golden era of art we have ahead of us now when digital meets art. And we move out of the fucking museums and get out of the fucking galleries and white walls and start making proper, interactive, participatory culture. I think it's going to be amazing. That's what I'm looking for for the next 100 years. The true Nietzsche attitude today is that, wow, this is a golden opportunity for art. Fuck anything else. That's basically Nietzsche. Even though the art that we see a lot, uh, at least walking around New York City, it really does not seem to be that impressive right now. It almost seems like an excuse for people to spend their money on crap and put that out there. I want to find something creative, but it's... No, no, uh... it's there to piss you off. That's exactly the point. <laughs> You're missing the point. Because creativity starts being pissed off. And that's, then you're forced to yeah. go home and say, how could you do something better than that? That's, that's a good point, I, yeah. That, that's, sort of, that's sort of bland, typical nonsensical oh, the art today is not what what kind of standards do you have for art have you studied art history you know what art is 
Probably not. Have you even studied Camille Paglia? Now, that's a great Nietzschean who does art history properly. Study Paglia and then speak your mind. In that order. Daniele, would you agree with what Alexander has to say about the death of a lot of these, uh, a lot of these paradigms? I mean, I think that's uh, that's kind of like where the whole conversation started. Is the fact that yeah, of course. I mean, one of the Nietzsche thing is the fact that there's an old war that has been dying for quite a while, <clears throat> that by now has been dead for a considerable amount of time, and pieces of it are keep dying along the way. The main issue has been the what has replaced it and where I think we would all like to see a little bit of a faster process, a more creative process, and ultimately better people involved who bring more energy and goods to the table. Because uh, I think the gap, you know, in historical times, if you look 400 years from now, maybe we'll feel like nothing. Maybe we'll feel like, oh, the death of the one paradigm and the creation of another was like that. When you live through it, it doesn't feel like it's like that. It feels like it's painfully slow and, you know, it's like something crashed into the wall, but nothing else has been reborn out of it yet. Or, of course, I mean, a million things have been reborn out of it, but not on that mass level that you would like to kind of, as you put it, walk down the street in New York City. So I think that's where it's at. It's like, yeah, of course, there's a model that, uh, <clears throat> and it's the same thing you said about masculinity. It's the same thing. You know, it shows up in ten thousand different ways. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just choking myself. <laughs> <laughs> the the question is, um, it really is the question. It just, and of course, it's always been the hard part of the equation because the the collapse of an existing model. This has happened ten million times before. The hard part is always the creative part, because any asshole can point a finger and say that model sucks. And it's like, yeah, sure, we all agree on that. War replaces it, which is often why political revolutions tend to fail, because everybody gets along and agree as long as you have a tyrant that is an asshole and you all recognize that he's an asshole. But when it's time for you to run the show, you're like, well, at least I'm not the tyrant. And it's like, yeah, that's nice. Congratulations, one step ahead, but like that's not a creative project. That's just saying uh, I'm not as shitty as they are, which is basically modern politics, you know. It's like so, Nick Lund Nick Lund pointed out very cleverly, he said that because of Hitler in 1945, we had the ultimate evil and he was dead. And anybody could just be opposed to Hitler and therefore they assumed to be brilliant. Right. Exactly. And what happened after 1945 is that we got the next 80 years of absolute mass mediocrity. Mm -hmm. Very little brilliance at all. And the problem I have with young men today, they come for me for guidance. They want to go this macho route. They want to be real men and all that. And, you know, and they've done a couple of courses, the red books for a couple of weeks. And they come back to me and think they're fucking leaders. I said, you're nothing. You know, my problem was that I was in the music industry for 25 years. And I was highly successful. You know how few people actually are successful because they have the talent and do the hard work? Because the vast majority of young men today think they're fucking talented when they're not. They haven't done the hard work and they're not talented. So they walk around in New York and say, yeah, this is shitty art, should be done something better. Well, you do it then. And they have nothing to prove. They have nothing there. The problem is the vast majority of people are very mediocre. This is Nietzsche's point. That's exactly when you go through Hegel and Nietzsche's fucking hard work, because these guys are totally, totally into self doubt. You cannot do Nietzsche without amount, huge amounts of self-doubt. There are no shortcuts. There are no quick fixes. There's no, I can just read three the Wikipedia articles and then I can look like I'm fucking brilliant. No, anybody today can tell from the name dropping that you haven't read it, you haven't done your work, you haven't read the books, you don't know what you're talking about. And the problem with the 25 year olds today, because they come out of this cuddled environment and they make a little rebellion against mothers so or they finally fear from mother, they still think they're God's gift to mankind. No, you're not. Your 24-year-old guy, he still wants your mother to applaud you, who don't know how to fuck a woman properly. You're not even a man. That's Nietzsche today. That's what we need to go with Nietzsche. What would you guys say to the argument that the doubtful people you've just described, Alexander, uh, give when it comes to the culture industry? Where they would say, like, oh, this is just all part of the cathedral, as Mencius Moldbug, Curtis Yarvin, calls it, that they'll never be able to 
you know, bring somebody like me to the table because it's like all. Oh, Curtis Yard will never lead anything. He's just a comfortable upper class brat sitting making little proto fascist comments. Come on, there's no depth to Curtis Yardman. Now I've said it, right? Okay, so go back to Nietzsche here since Nietzsche is where we're at, and we know he's a serious guy. I, none of these guys are up to it, they don't even fuck women, not even sexual. That to me is the first test of being a man and being embodied. You do whatever you have, you give it to women, you fuck women, right? You fuck women with your brothers, even better. You're even more confident. You know, that's where you need to go. If you're not even there, if you're just sitting there like a fucking insult, terrified of women, making up these sort of provocative things and spread them online, it's not impressive. It's not depth. It's not profound. All I tell these guys, shut the fuck up. Do martial arts, go into nature if you want to be a real man. Reconnect with nature because women are much more comfortable in culture than you are. Go out in nature with your brothers, create a strong brother with these guys, and maybe you can figure out a business idea, start a company. That's usually what men do well. And take a risk and see if it works. And then you're worth at least a fucking woman getting married. If you have ambitions beyond that, like real leadership ambitions, you better be incredibly talented lucky in that department you must work very very hard and these guys are not they they, they don't show the talent and they, they they don't show the necessity to work hard they don't understand what it's about that's the problem daniela you concur yeah and i think that's where <clears throat> it's the difference between uh posers and the real deal um it is about the results you produce it is about stepping up and now the problem is I take it even uh, in another, slide, no, actually not even another direction, it's the same point with another element to it, <clears throat> is you do get somebody who finally does something, he's not just sitting on the couch pontificating about how the world should be, but he's actually maybe, and then they get infatuated with the one part of their life in which they actually show a bit of a spine. Maybe they have been at jiu-jitsu for 20 years and they're actually good when they step on the mat and they are tough and they are resilient. They're like, That's pretty good. That's a great start. But you're still a fucking idiot in every other aspect of your lives. So it's like, that was a great step. Upload you. But like, Okay, more, more. Take it in other places. Show it. Show to me the same ability to do the hard work and get the results in this other field and this other one and this other one. Then you are a real human being. You know what I mean? And not that there's anything wrong with starting somewhere. Of course, everybody's got to start somewhere. Right? If you are bad, if you are good at one thing, is a whole lot better than being good at zero things. No argument there. But the question is, how many aspects of your life can you bring it to? Can you embody it? Because otherwise, your one thing that you are good at, that you show actual some quality, is like this little happy oasis in the middle of a shitty life, which ultimately hasn't really transformed your personality. It has only transformed the fact that when you put the right clothes on and you go into that environment, something actually decent comes out. But to me, that's like, okay, that's great. That's step one. It gets you going. It teaches you how to. Do, you learn how to do it in one field. That's fantastic. That's way more than most people. Now learn how to apply those insights in ten other fields, in ten other, in every other aspect of your life. And then you can outsource. That's why I talk about the team or the gang constantly. If you want to get your shit together, you're a young man. Find the other four. They should compliment you. They should have other talents that you have. Then you can really impress, right? So. Finding the gang, which obviously a lot of guys are fantasizing about. Get out of that whole self-reliance thing. Get out of the Marlboro Man loop. Get out of the Sigma male. system thing. Find the other guys. Start a company mm. with the other guys. Start a fucking boy band if you want to. Do whatever. You Get together with the other guys where you shine at your specific archetype that you're really good at, and they can shine at theirs. And then show them you admire them for being really good at what you're not very good at. That impresses women. That means other guys. You know, the real self-confidence is not proving to people when you walk into the room. That you're really good at something. The real self confidence actually comes up and says, I'm not very good at that, but I've got a friend who's good at it. Let's call him. That's real self confidence. Because then you got a map of the entire patriarchy at the center of you being respected, and you can hire the guys to do these different things that actually need to be done. So you can, you can outsource that. That's what men do brilliantly when they work in a team. And that's exactly what I want to get the guys out of this all for themselves loop, out of the, out of the narcissism. And instead, go into group group mode, which is dreaming about and find that gang, and that's hard work. 
But the, martial arts is a good start because you got to be physical with other guys in martial arts. Second step, get out in nature. Five guys crossing a mountain, taking on a challenge, being out in the wilderness for four weeks, no guaranteed survival. It will strengthen your character immensely. And then you can go into the next step. I, I would also add that I think it's very important to understand the time you live in and make a map of it. Simon Critchley has famously said to basically the political left, of which he was a part in the past, that this is not the time for revolution. Yes, there's a revolution in Ukraine and there's a revolution in Iran. And I expect most of the talent, both for men and women, to come out in culture in the next 20 years to come from those places. Maybe with some Ethiopians and Nigerians that are hungry added to it. I don't think America and certainly not Europe will shine over the next 20 years. I think Ukraine and Iran will, because when you're at the conflict in the middle of a revolution, it produces fantastic creative results. But you can't do that in Europe and America. Critch's point is that this is not the time for revolution. This is time for retraction. This is historically time you do, as the Zarathustra character does in Nietzsche, you leave, you get out, you build a fucking monastery in the mountains with your brothers. You resign from this spectacle that's going on because there's no role to be sane in the public arena any longer because we're at the end of a paradigm that's going absolutely hysterical. Like all paradigms do, they go supernova before they finally implode. So this sort of hysterical field we got out there, it's, it's a form of feminine hysteria that dominates culture today. If you're there, you're a man. Just step aside. You don't need to be part of it. Create your own fucking online subculture. Keep the doors closed. Get the other guys together. Build a fucking digital monastery somewhere in the countryside and go into deep studies. That is, to me, the best investment that a young man can do today. And that's called retraction in Critchley. And Critchley is a very Nietzschean thinker. I think the time for retraction among men. And that's why I'm looking for guys of a sort of more monkish archetype. The monks really have a great period ahead of them. That's why both Daniel and I do Eastern philosophy. Because Taoism, Zoroastrianism, and Buddhism teaches you how to be monk. And that is a, it, you, it's a male archetype that I think has the golden age of it. The artist and the monk are the ones I'm watching out for at the moment. The uh, guys who end up doing that, one of the things they may be concerned about is having another Branch Davidians, David Koresh situation, where as soon as you get a bunch of guys together somewhere where they're not going to be as dependent upon the state... Then lo and behold, the state's going to come in with the ATF and they're going to crash the party. Have you studied the guys who joined the Branch Davidian sect? No. None of them was even 12 mentally. Men don't join sects. Men create a cult around their fucking phallus. Just like women create a cult around the matrix. Real women create a cult around their pussy. Real men create a cult around their dick and its strength. That's but, fundamentally what religion is. I always mm. say that religion is for men, spirituality is for women. That's a good division. The phallic cult then holds you responsible for delivering on the phallic, meaning being a real man and delivering in the world so that you create an abundance, way more than you need. And when you deliver an abundance to a woman, she will go totally on fire about you and she will give you generosity in return. The trade between the male abundance and the female generosity is the sexual relationship. And would this is what this... guys are dying to do. Yeah. First, you create a team. Mm -hmm. You go out in the wilderness with the team. You come back and you, pro you prove to the community, the matriarch essentially, that you survived. Matriarch says, good, well done, boys. But you're not ready to fuck women yet because you now have to go out there and go hunting and come back with the bait and then come back and deliver. And if you deliver in abundance, women will certainly want to fuck you. That's how sexuality operates. Would you combine uh, the idea of the woman together with the uh, state or not? Because what I'm trying to figure out here, Alexander, is even if you're saying that they had, uh, you know, mental deficiencies, these David Koresh people, there is still a risk people see of if we do anything that makes us more independent of this approaching uh, technocracy, then the technocracy is going to go after us and it's going to destroy all our hard earned work. It's not interested in you. Get off your fucking narcissism again. Listen, either you want to go back to primordial childhood and get a fucking tit in your mouth and, and see, s s suck the tit. That's being dependent on welfare, for example. Mamela is everywhere in culture today. States are huge. Governments are huge. And they basically give you handouts and they make a little baby again. Now, if you want to do that, you might as well take opium. 
because every fucking opium addict I ever met was exactly like that. He, he, he wanted to go back and be a little baby sucking a tit again and thought the world was harsh and tough and everything was too challenging for him and he just wanted to be a baby. Okay, okay, pathetic. The alternative is to go away from Amela. You're supposed, you're, supposed, you're supposed to hate your mother's tit when you're one year old. This is female psychoanalysis. This is Yula Cristeva. You're supposed to hate and objectify the tit and you feel the shame you ever sucked it. That creates a search for the phallus, which is the negation of the mimula. The phallus represents what you want to be one day, but you got a tiny penis because you're a boy. What do you do? You mimic the other man, and you want to have the respect, and one day they tell you, now you're one of us. And that's the rite of passage and culture that men need. And then you, they tell you, you are now physically, physiologically a man. You're not mentally there yet. But if you go out with your brothers and prove you can survive in the wilderness on your own, and then you come back with an abundance and deliver that, then you're one of us. That's essentially what masculinity is. There is a comment that we have over here. And by the way, everybody sneed those super chats because the last part, we are going to be getting into the super chats. But this is a non-super chat comment that I did want to read just so we get a bit of a pushback here. So this is by the Brody, Brody Biz who says, yeah, they totally don't care, which is why they make you pay property taxes and participate in the system no matter what. What would be your Move response? Move to Panama or Paraguay like the crypto guys do. You can leave America. Get off your, get off your fat ass and move. The bitching doesn't get you anywhere with me and all the other. Because we're Nietzscheans. <laughs> we don't feel sorry for you. Sorry. Get off your ass. Get going. But as far as uh, what is going to happen in the meantime when we are going to be uh, retreating into the monkish uh, sanctuaries, as far as whether things are going to accelerate, get worse... What are some predictions you guys can make? So, uh, Daniela, uh, let me know what you think. What what exactly awaits us in the years to come here? I mean, it's if you're talking about culture at large, yes, yeah, the odds are always shit, you know, because it's like I mean, even if you think about something as which unfortunately has become news again, like the whole concept of no nuclear warfare. It only need to happen once, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I remember when the IRA tried to bomb uh, Margaret Thatcher and uh, they missed there by this much, and then they sent her a message that say, look, congratulations, you survived, but you have to survive every one of our attempts. We only need to get it right once. Uh, unfortunately, there are some serious existential threats uh, that exist in the world today, both in terms, both in terms of environmental threats. There are threats in terms of self annihilation through warfare. There, there are all sorts of threats. None of them that look particularly good. The problem is none of those thoughts are very empowering for us because there's nothing we can do about it as an individual level. There's nothing that I can go out tomorrow and fix uh, the state of the world environmentally or politically or in terms of warfare. So the question then becomes, that game is out of my hands. There's not a whole lot I can do about that part. What can I do about, these are the cards I'm handed. What can I, how can I play them within this given context? Uh, it's for me even almost pointless to speculate and muse about how things are gonna go on a mass level of which I have no power to affect. What interests me is what I do have power to affect. That's why it's like talking about <clears throat> the government is going to come after me if I do something good. Well, do something good first. Then worry <laughs> about the government coming after mm -hmm. you. But if you are also a college it, professor. So you have students that listen to you. Would you say you can have a positive impact uh, on them? And out of curiosity, what would you say is their state right now? You know, after the pandemic and all that and... Uh, are, would you say that they are leaning into a more positive or more uh, dread-filled uh, direction as far as what the future holds? I'm a big fan of uh, realistic optimism, meaning I hate the guys who are just told everything is for the best, uh, whatever it is, good, it's worth. It's like, no, shit is shit, and there's plenty around. But once we have established the shit is shit, what are you going to do about it? Like there's one line, my one of my old time favorite guys, EQ, uh, Zen monk from the 1400s, has this line that I love to death that says, throw me into hell and I'll find a way to enjoy it. You know, it's, it's not denying that there's such a thing as hell. It's not denying that real bad things can and do happen. 
is yes, that's all true, you are correct. But fuck you, I'm still gonna find a way to enjoy it. I'm still going to so that's the opposite of a victim mentality, right? Is uh, and again, some people deny the victim mentality because they deny that there there are conditions that can objectively victimize people. That's not that's just delusional. That's just pretending that reality is not reality. To me, it's like a knowledge that there are ten million bad things around you, and find a way to make kids smile, to improve the day of everyone you run into, to create something beautiful. And if your worry is that some big force out there is going to squash you and the things may not work out well, feel gloriously. You know what I mean? Feel like a goddamn hero. Then uh, I'm interested. That's that's a good attitude. Uh, worrying too much about shit that you have no control and no power to affect, is, it just takes away all your power. There's no There's no point going there. I totally subscribe to Danielle's view here. So I think we need to understand something very peculiar happened in the 21st, 20th century. So when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, everybody saw it simultaneously. What this synchronization of the international news feed did was that it created a sense of centralization. Like that there's a globe here, there's a world here, we're all part of it, and there's a public arena where everything is staged. The internet has blown that myth apart. We live in a very fragmented world now. I don't think that's bad. I don't think it's bad at all. I think Russia's going to fall apart. I think China is heading all the wrong way. Even America will start shaking very soon. I think places like Dubai and Singapore are the winning models of the world today. I work with governments in Estonia and Slovenia. I love small countries. I think human beings are increasingly going to go local, local, local. Here's where the retraction comes in. It's not that you leave the world and boycott it. It's like you leave the world until the better time arrives where you can actually produce something that's valuable to people. So you retract to create a value that you can then present to people later when they're welcoming towards it. That's what retraction needs. I think this is a good time for retraction. I think the best bet I can make today is that technology is going global and human beings are going local. That means human beings are going into a dark age. I don't think that's a problem. I think we all go tribal and subcultural and we find our little communities that we live our lives in, like Daniela proposed. That's what we can do. I think when it comes to the huge issues for the world today, like climate change, if that even is an issue, maybe we should just get people moving around a bit more, you know, give Siberia to the Bangladeshis because the Russians are too drunk or whatever. You know, come up with some innovative solutions to it. Just move people around. Migration has always been a good thing in history. No man's always did better than people who settled and got fat. I don't have a problem with those things. But technology will go global. AI will increasingly solve the administrative problems that human beings are incapable of solving because they're too corrupt. Okay? If that is the case, and a sociocracy rise, then technology will go global. And technology will regard the global as a global empire that we write about. Human beings will go completely local. They're a much lower level. They'll be tribal, subcultural, because we're more comfortable with that. We can trust that. We can have our own membranes or borders around our communities, both in cyberspace and the physical space. I think that's way, way, way more likely. So I'm looking forward towards the dark ages. I think we're going into the dark ages, and I mean that in a positive sense. I think it makes perfect sense. Because the short, brief little time in history, we played around with the idea of having a centralized, international, global news feed controlled by America. Those days are over. There's not going to be any more Neil Armstrong moments in world history. You don't see the uh, big tech companies as consolidating information where it's going to be a lot harder for people to not be a part of some bigger thing. Google are terrified of the search engine without ads. It's that easy right now. Google knows that even Google can go down. And Google is still seven massive innovations in a fantastic innovative space. But they started doing work policies at Google too, and it became poison at their offices. They have to clean that out too to survive for another few years. Facebook is done, over and done with. I'm not the slightest bit terrified of big tech. And if Elon Musk is gonna make a prick of himself, I think Elon Musk <laughs> should really buy Twitter and give it a free and open algorithm that is transparent, get the ads off, have people pay for it and get a new fucking netocratic elite use Twitter. That could be a model for the future of social media. As far as Instagram is concerned, it's fucking junkyard for teenage girls with psychiatric problems today. <laughs>
it's the least sexy thing you could ever think of. I mean, big tech is not what you make it to be. It's just that it looks pompous compared to the miserability of politics and government. But it's not the future. Big tech is not the future. Big tech is just the beginning because data collection and data processing is going to be fundamental to the future. Do you think the current big tech giants will handle that? They're run by fucking autistic guys. I have no idea what it means to be human. How hard but, is it to kill that? Not hard at all, to be honest about it. So if we have something like TikTok right now, which a lot of younger people are getting very obsessed about, what exactly can be done to stop that feedback loop where you're just constantly taking selfies it's of yourself? It's entertainment and for kids and they pay me well. I make hundreds of thousands of dollars for TikTok. Leave them to it. I like the money. I'm a fucking whore when it comes to TikTok. It's just fucking children's entertainment. It's not going to fuck up the kids. You know, and if you're concerned with your kids, don't give them a fucking smartphone until they're 16. This is dialectical process that any fucking regular bourgeois 40 year old person can figure out for their kids. Oh, we shouldn't give our kids smartphone when they're 11. We should wait until they're 16. Yeah, because in Silicon Valley, they do. Oh, they can figure that out. That's going to be the standard in a few years' time. I'm not worried about those things. I hope it is, but I'm just seeing from uh, the generation of people who are in their 60s, they seem to be incredibly glued to Facebook, and uh, it makes some people suspect that people are turning more into uh, robots, although no, maybe... Uh, no, they are on Facebook because they live in fucking Spain and Florida and Mexico, and they have tons of money, they drive Teslas, they have mansions, and they just like to think, who else lives in Cancun this winter, and what kind of flowers are you putting ahead of your apartments or something, you know? No, Facebook works for these guys because they're completely controlled and contained and they're wealthy like mad. The people who are 60, 70 years old today, they run the world. So, no, no, Facebook works for them. They do exactly what they were supposed to do. It's basically just social media glue and nothing else. I know, Daniele, like with uh, your own situation, the people who are in your life and their friends, do you notice people becoming a lot uh, more distracted by technology? Do you think that that does something to the brain over time where even though you could say before people had newspapers and they were being distracted that way, it seems like our attention span has been lessened? And what exactly does that hold for uh, the future? Sure. I mean, I think anytime you introduce uh, new big changes in people's daily life, you know, when it was TV, when it became VCRs and became music that you can carry anywhere, internet way more so, social media even more so, of course, it should come with a user manual, which of course it doesn't because you have to figure it out, especially when a, when a technology is new. You need to figure out what actually works for you, what's healthy and what's not. It's like if somebody, if you have never seen alcohol in your life and somebody put uh, uh, four gallons of whiskey in front of you, odds are you're probably not going to do a great job at the way you handle your alcohol. You're probably going to take a sip, go like, holy shit, that felt good. I'm going to take five more. Wait, I'm going to go for the gallon. And it's like, well, there's a way to use it that it works and it can actually make your life more fun. And there's a way to use it where you are destroying yourself. I think culturally, because there hasn't been, you know, there hasn't been generations before that have used social media that can show you, hey, this is how you do it, where it actually can help your life. And if you go this path, well, it can fuck you up. I think it's still people are figuring it out. And of course, people figuring it out means that 90 plus percent are going to fail at it for a long as time and they're going to pass that to their kids and so on. So I think it's part of a process of, uh, of figuring out first and foremost for yourself, uh, have discussion with people around you about what's the best way. To, it's like a new tool, you know, if you discover fire or something, you know, there's a, you can burn down your whole goddamn village because you don't know how to use it carefully. Or you can have tastier food and be warm during the night, you know. It's, uh, it's part of a learning curve, I think. And uh, yes, the concerns are legitimate. At the same time, the, the answers are there. It's, it's a process of figuring it out. My last question uh, has to do with uh, Joe Rogan, since uh, somebody like him does serve as an example to a lot of younger people, as well as now going to Texas, having his own thing there with like Kill Tony, Tony Henchcliffe and all those cats. Yeah. That is something that, like uh, Alexander was talking about, I think a lot of younger men especially are longing for. They're longing to have that kind of community of people that actually care about you. And they, I think, live vicariously through the podcasts of Joe Rogan. Like when you talk to Joe, they like to pretend that they're there. 
I don't think that is that far off because when I went to Skankfest, for instance, several times, you know, they had Tony Hinchcliffe there as well as the uh, Legion of Skanks people, a lot of other great comics. It definitely felt like a brotherhood. It definitely felt like something that I want to keep revisiting. And I even have dreams a lot of times where I'm back at that place. So I am 100% with what both of you guys are talking about as far as getting there. What do you think are some other things that people should consider before stepping into that role? Like what are, what are some other things that people may be missing, the missing ingredients from being able to do that? Or have well, we pretty much covered everything? I think one of the huge problems today if you look, particularly in the Western world, is uh, loneliness. You know, uh, are the way our what lives are structured, the majority of people don't really interact that much. Uh, like the, the individualistic model is built on you, your family packs up because there is a job opportunity across the country. You severe old ties with the kids you grew up with. You find new friends, uh, which you have to find in about three minutes because you're going to move somewhere. Else. And there's this... And you look at the results, you know, in terms of suicide rates, in terms of depression, in terms of everything else. I think one of the there are obviously many factors for why that is. But one of the big ones is alienation and loneliness. People are lonely as hell. Uh, dating is almost done all online on a profile that you check for three seconds because people don't you, people don't go out in group of friends and you meet some other friends of this other person and all that. I mean, when I left Italy, I felt that Italy wasn't warm and social enough. And then I came to U.S. And I was like, what? Oh, fuck, this is oh, uh, takes it to a whole other level. You know, I remember being in school, like not even now, so like 20 plus years ago, where in college I would be asking some guy that I had a couple of classes with, like, so, okay, uh, how's the college experience going for you? Like, who are your friends? And he was like... Uh, you are and i'm like really because we're not friends so i don't know what i mean i didn't oh no you crushed his poor soul no No, he didn't didn't say that but in my mind i'm like holy shit we are barely acquaintances what are you talking about you know yeah and then i look around and i realize that that is the gig you know the fact is we are hardwired for tribal cultures we are it's in our dna to be part of a community it's our dna to be part of a tight-knit group of people and we have our society structure in the exact opposite way. In the, you get into your car, drive to a job, you're sitting in your cubicle, you drive back home, and not surprisingly, people are flipping out and their brains can't handle it because it's not the way human beings are designed to function. So the idea of needing to find community, the idea of creating community, of creating, uh, the way Alexander was putting it, brotherhoods, creating a tight-knit group of friends is essential. You know, if you care about your mental health, that's definitely one of the things to look into. It's hard because our society does not make it easy. You know, from the jobs we have to the houses we live in to all of that, it's not an easy thing to create a village. But I think is it's an important challenge to figure out how to make it happen because the benefits are huge and the downsides are equally dramatic. Well, there doesn't seem to be that much pressure right now to do that if we're talking about survival. As long as people have a certain amount of creature comforts in life, there's only going to be, I think, a rare few, like Alexander was talking about, who can do this. And for most people, if, they're, if they don't have their butt to the fire, then what exactly is going to prompt them? Like, if we don't have the religions anymore, if we don't have the strict, you know, my my daughter will never marry a, Catholics, uh, a, a Catholic guy. You know, if we don't have any of that anymore to kind of keep people within these uh, communities by force, and I'm against force, but I'm still saying, like, if the force wait, is not there. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Here's where the problem in narcissism comes in. Mm-hmm. So this is called iconology. It used to be called politism. You have idols. You worship your idols. You want to be like them. You mimic them. Okay. People realized in the past that the gods were global. You're local. You're not them. You can only mimic them in a much smaller, on a much smaller scale. So you can have a family. You can have a job and go somewhere. 
And in the sense that Americans are less religious than the Europeans, it's just that the Americans go to church a lot more because they need some kind of community. Otherwise, Americans with their fucking narcissism and their individualism and selling themselves constantly. Americans are, you meet them in the elevator and they got a sales pitch going. And you're just like, oh God, not another American. It's just like acquaintances, acquaintances, and no friends. No quality relationship, just acquaintances everywhere, right? So that's why Americans go to church, because at least the church says, just bend down, pretend you're a Pentecostal Christian, the pad you on your head, at least you get a community. That's why churches work in America. You add a prefix to the very weak identity of being in America. You're Lutheran American, Catholic American, Muslim American, whatever, you're an American. You have to have a prefix, because otherwise you have no community to trust, because America is just a flag and a national anthem and nothing else. Is really weak compared to, say, Italy and Sweden as an identity. That's why Americans pretend to be religious and go to church. But everybody needs that fucking community. And without the community, you're nothing. And if you're a guy on your own and you don't have a community, you're either an incel or a really horrible pussyhound. Because Nietzsche's point is that on your own, lonely, you're definitely a slave. You're a slave to anybody who would want you. You submit to anybody who gives you attention because your loneliness plagues you so badly that you have to go to that ultimate, you know, pathetic state of just being able to be a slave to anybody who wants you as a slave. That's where you end up when you're going to do your own thing and self-rely and God and selling yourself, whatever you're going to do. Just stop that whole thing. There is no brand value to a personal name any longer, not even to mine. It's all about the connections, the network, the, the friends you have. And not people you know, but people you actually hang out with, socialize with, and live with. I'm all for return to the large family. Have you guys seen uh, what's happening in certain parts of China right now? And this m probably is happening for decades, but I just wasn't aware of it. Where you have families of like a hundred something people that all combine together to buy a certain piece of property, you know, with a yard, with the ability to have like a lot of farming going on there. And they just, you know, with a spa and they just stay there and they help each other out and they keep everything within this family of hundreds of people. And it's very different from this American approach that I found and from the Italian approach, I'd say, or Jewish approach in my case. Uh, oh, no, no, rather the Jewish and the Italian approach would be closer to that. The American approach would be further away where the old folks go to the old folks home where the child is supposed to. And I understand, Alexander, when you were talking about, you know, like rejecting the breast. But in this sense, the child is completely on their own, makes their own way, and has no support from the uh, family, let alone the community. And that, I think, has also contributed to the isolation that people are feeling today. I don't think the problem here is that you're not supported. I think you're over-supported. I think people still infantile for way too long. This is a little bit of mm. the book I wrote, John Sadek, argues that we're way too infantile. We're children until we're 30 years old. And the problem is when you're 35, your ideas are fixed. You don't change much. There's a room for being an adult any longer. That's why the word I use constantly is the art of adultification. So it's not more support you need. Parents are spending an awful lot of time with the kids. They're divorcing, and then they're spending time with the kids. Sure, there's no firm foundation in terms of family. Maybe there's more honesty. I don't know. I don't care about that at all. I don't think there's a lack of support to kids, but I think the, the kids are, are sold a lie. And that lie is that with very little effort, you can get all the attention you want in life, and you can get fame, and you can be a celebrity, you can be successful. That's the lie we're teaching the kids, and that's wrong. Alexander, do you agree? And we're going to be uh, ending this real soon, but let me know. So I guess you're throwing it back to me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's like it goes back to that concept of like, bad archetypes and the ping pong between them because the reality is like why is it that you have this hyper and individualistic approach in us and it became popular in many cases it was a reaction to the fact that sometimes small communities were stifling sometimes you have uh, the small community put in pressure to conform and squash your idiosyncrasies and squash who you are at the core and so people are like, screw it. I want to go to the city where I can be me. Nobody's uh, bugging me. There's not 10 families around who are all looking at me and pointing fingers. And both are correct. You know what I mean? It's like the small community is what we badly need. The small community has a dark side, which is sometimes pressure to conform and squashing the individual. The leaving the city by yourself approach allow you, gives you more freedom 
to express yourself as an individual, but also cuts you off from the thing that makes you human, which is part of being a community. So again, the idea is not one or the other, it's taking the best from each. How do we create tight-knit communities that also allow individuals to thrive and be themselves and not everybody breathing down the throat, gossiping, just going like, hey, those guys need to fall in line or else. You know, it's of course is a delicate balance. In some ways, a paradox, right? But all solutions to any war problem worth discussing tend to be paradoxical because they seem to combine elements that seem contradictory initially. And yeah, without them, we are stuck with half of the deal. Or the, it's kind of like in Italy, there was always this joke about not flattering joke about cops regarding. Uh, uh, kind of why do they go together? Is the, why do they go always in teams of two? Is because one can read and one can write, and the whole idea there was like, well, you want both. You don't want one or the other. You want an ability to do two things at once, and in this case, you do need both. Uh, the illusion of individualism is a problem because it solves one problem and creates another. Small communities solve one problem and create another. The key is how to combine it in a way that you get the best of both without the downsides of both. Of course, easier said than done, but at least setting it up as a goal is a starting point. Then it becomes, say, how do we get there? What's the strategy to make that happen? Which is a whole different discussion. But, uh, but at least the goal should be clear. Definitely, Can I just ask yeah. a question now to Daniel? Yeah. Sure. Why Taoism? I think because to me, Taoism speak the language of life. Like to me, it's not even about Taoism as a ism. It's like if you, even like to me, like where we started with the whole uh, three steps of Nietzsche, camel, lion, uh, child, that's Taoism right there to me. And I don't know how much Nietzsche was aware or not of Taoist thing. There are a few things that shows that there's some awareness, but you know, who knows what he had access to in Germany in the late 1800s. But to me, there are certain insights that are that if you pay attention to life, you pick up on. And Taoism just happened to do a particularly do good job at putting them into words. But again, those are ideas that anybody who's aware and alive can pick up without ever having heard of Taoism. So whereas most philosophies, most religions, you need to study them to be able to get the key concepts, that isn't definitely doesn't require that. You know, you can, you can, we can have a whole conversation and somebody can make one brilliant Taoist point after another without having ever heard of Taoism. And so to me, this is a long winded way of saying it really because to me it speaks the language of life. If you understand those principles, you understand life. That's why there's such a connection. So I converted to Zoroastrianism. I was very close to converting to Taoism. Mm -hmm. And essentially, the Tao mm -hmm. is Asha in Persian. Mm -hmm. It's Arta in India, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, today, I write books about the Silk Road Triad, which I try to combine Taoist, Taoism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, essentially as one with an Indian, one a Persian, and one is a Chinese tradition. They've, the confluence between them is fantastic. Yep. Over thousands of years, they just traded ideas constantly. Basically, when you went along the Silk Road, you'd go into Kasta, which is essentially monastery, in one oasis along the Silk Road. You go to the next oasis and found another Kostak. It was just slightly, slightly different from the last one. And sort of these small differences maybe eventually created these isms, which basically are Europeans applied them to these type of thinking. But for me, this is a rich place to start from today, especially when we talk of masculinity and we talk about Nietzsche as we do here. Because what Nietzsche and Hegel were looking for was a spirituality beyond Christianity. Mm -hmm. and, and I always claim that the Enlightenment, actually Europe, was basically saying that Christianity is not good enough. It might be good enough for religion for women and children, but it's not a religion that takes masculinity into it. And that's exactly what capitalism and nationalism has responses to that. Mm -hmm. And I think now for capitalism and nationalism to mature, the place to go is the Silk Road tribe. That's why I'm interested in why you pursue Taoism. I think it's a very, very similar pattern that I took. I just... I was just offered in 1992 to go to Persian rather than the Chinese Tantra. And they're the same anyway. So right. I picked the Persian route. That's what I did. Nice. 
Well, we have a super chat from JDJW, who is also a BTR patron, by the way. And if you guys want to help break the rules, the show that combines everybody together, brings everybody on, uh, patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. You're also going to get a lot of very beautiful handcrafted designs by my father, Alexander Polyakov. Here you can see them on the screen. Maple, mahogany, ashwa, cherry. Uh, very beautiful designs here for the 20 dealer $20 patronage and for the $50 you are going to get a custom magnet so whatever design you want if you want the design of uh I don't know uh Zoroaster or Nietzsche with the mustache or who knows like Alexander if you don't mind your likeness being used maybe like an Alexander bar with like the big bushy beard who knows there's a lot of different possibilities there but anyway patreon.com slash break the rules become a patron today and here is the uh, super chat I think if we all build up personal relationship with God, know ourselves, and take accountability for our actions, we as a whole will progress. I, I, don't, mean, know that, yeah. I don't know who that personal God is. The only God that I acknowledge is time. And time is a merciless bitch who doesn't care about you. Now learn to live with that. Daniela, do you acknowledge God? Do you believe in God? To me, it's like I don't even know what we're talking about when we use the word God because it means so many different things to so many different people that it's like... To, and ultimately, I don't care in the sense that it's like as long as it works for you, that's what counts. It's like if that... Uh, like I don't care about what people believe or don't believe. My thing is if whatever it is you believe leads you to be a nicer human being, kinder to your kids, a better neighbor, I'm all for it. Doesn't mean I want to hear about it, but I'm all for it because the results are clearly good. So that's what I care. I care about the results of the ideas, not so much about the ideas themselves, per se. Yeah, well, especially with the Mormons, that seems to be working out pretty well. Uh, anyway, we are going to go now, but I want to thank yeah. Alexander, Daniele. It was a great pleasure to have you on, Daniele, for the first time. Hopefully not the last. I would definitely love to have you on again, brother. I really appreciate the time that you uh, put into this, that both of you guys put into this. And uh, what else are you guys working on before we go? What are the next steps? So, Alexander, let me know. I just want to thank Daniele for joining this conversation. Looking forward to meeting you eventually. I think you're fantastic. So great much. work done love to get us both on the show tonight uh you know i love you i think you're a great kid so yeah it was just an honor to be here thank Real you pleasure. so much for uh for the chat i really enjoyed it i really appreciate uh having met alexander at least virtually and having this conversation um yeah uh how about the uh create your own religion book or anything else that you would want to promote no i don't no? do sales pitches like <laughs> no i know you don't else. i don't you don't Kids Daniele. are sick of it Daniele, sales pitch. if Daniele. you're interested in my work you can google okay, it. okay that's, that's alexander that's I, Daniele. I google is always i think google is always your friend right all right as long as yeah. you figure out how to spell somebody's name you decide you like them you can always get check out what they do in life and uh yeah. all right hey them. i i tried that's all i'm gonna say i tried all right thank <laughs> you guys with the line. that's always good Thank you guys yeah. so much for watching, and also be sure to watch the interview with uh, Savannery M in the BTR archives. It's like way, way, way back, one of the first things that uh, BTR has done. Be sure to check it out. Savannery is amazing, great MMA fighter, and uh, I wish her the very best as well. I don't know if she's here right now with you, Daniele, but... Uh... No, she actually went to, because uh, my daughter was coming out of school right now, so she went to pick her up. Oh, nice. All right, well, there we go, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, smash that subscribe button, smash